number 10, spicy defense. Usually when you think about wars from ancient times, you think of swords, spears, bows, and arrows as being the primary weapons used to fight, but that wasn't entirely the case with the ancient Greeks. It turns out that their warfare was a lot more advanced than you'd think. The ancient Greeks were actually known to have used chemical warfare as part of their defense. They were known to use poison tipped arrows and incendiary weapons. The earliest example of such a thing in ancient Greece comes from the siege of Plataea in 429 BC when Spartan soldiers set fire to a wood pile with sulfur, releasing sulfur dioxide gas into the air and forcing the opposing force to flee their positions. According to other accounts, they may have also poisoned the water supply. The most famous case of chemical warfare from the Greeks, however, comes from the Byzantine Greeks when they invented a petroleum based substance that couldn't be extinguished with water and would be fired from tubes that were attached to Greek ships. What's so cool about that is the fact that no one has ever been able to recreate it. At number 9, hashtag roasted. I'm sure you've no doubt heard of the messed up punishment devices that have been used throughout history. I have to say that the people of the past were very creative when it came to coming up with ways to bring harm to others, and the ancient Greeks were no exception. I mean, they certainly weren't the worst when it came to their punishments, but they still were going a little overboard. One of their famously horrific torture devices was called the brazen bull. It was a large hollow casting of a bull made from bronze that had a door installed into the side of it. When someone was up for punishment via the brazen bull, they would be stuffed inside the statue, the door would be closed on them, and a fire would be lit under the bull, heating the metal statue. The person inside would then be sadly roasted alive. I would much rather be roasted on Twitter than inside this mighty metal bull, that's for sure. Before we carry on talking about the messed up things that went on in ancient Greece, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. And number 8, questionable relationships. The ancient Greeks had some pretty questionable habits when it came to the coming of age of young Greeks. The idea of a relationship between an older person and one who has not yet come of age was not only normal, but was encouraged. As part of the coming of age of young Greek boys, they would be part of a ritualistic kidnapping. Now don't worry, they weren't actually being taken from their beds in the middle of the night. This was more so an agreement made by the boy's father ahead of time, but either way, they would still be taken by an older person from the community, where they would be taken out into the wilderness and taught how to hunt, they would feast, and they would learn how to be an adult. They would later return to the community where they would be given the choice of either severing ties with their adult partner or continuing their relationship with them. It's certainly a little unsettling the fact that this kind of thing was normal. At number 7, backwards logic. It was tough being a woman in ancient Greece. I mean, it's been tough being a woman at any time throughout history and we're still fighting for our place in society on many fronts, but back in the times of ancient Greece, they had it really bad. Part of Greek society included the notion that women were objects and as a result, the Greek Greeks saw adultery as a worse crime than non-consensual relations. Now you're probably scratching your head thinking, why? And my dear viewer, I will tell you why they had this sort of backwards logic. You see, since women were considered to be objects and property, any kind of misconduct or mistreatment to a woman, especially one spouse, this was considered to be almost like theft of this object, and so if found guilty, the person responsible for this injustice would be tried for adultery, not the real crime at hand, being the mistreatment of a woman. The punishment for an adulterer was quite severe as when caught, they could risk being killed on the spot and in the event of whatever affair, that would be grounds for an immediate divorce. At number 6, deformed males. Further on the topic of the presence of women in ancient Greek society, let's talk about how women were seen in their communities. Now even though Aristotle was considered to be one of the greatest philosophers in history, his ideas were also quite flawed. During his life he believed that women were deformed males who were created when quote, something went wrong in their mother's wombs. End quote. They considered women to be so terrible that the philosopher Plato also warned men against being reincarnated as a woman in the next life, saying that this could be avoided if they had lots of success during their current lifetime. Because of this view on women, baby girls were often abandoned, girls education focused primarily on how to have and raise a family, and when girls were married off, they were considered to be property like I mentioned in the previous number. Number 5 is the dirty gal. And sadly, it is so not in a fun way, rather the opposite. 
For some wild reason, the Greeks believed women had a really unique susceptibility to the things deemed impure. This is everything gross you could think of. So pus, feces, discharges and secretions, animal dung, rotten foods, the whole shebang. These things affected women in a way they did not affect men. Sure, it didn't mean she was more easily grossed out by it, but it also must mean that it's better for her. So naturally, literal filth became part of the treatments for ladies. One awful example is how a woman suffering from a discharge could be prescribed to drink roasted meal dung mixed with hot wine. If you lost your baby amidst that tragedy, they'd be rubbing cow dung all over you. If you've seen some of our medieval videos, you may have heard about the whole wandering womb concept of the olden times, where people believed that a womb could just wander around inside a woman's body or just vacate it entirely as if it's got little legs. Well, anyways, the whole reason for the cow dung thing is they believe that the womb would be so disgusted by the smell of dung that it would run away and leave her of the trauma. And so the tradition for terrible, filthy medicine for the women of Greece carried on for centuries. Number four is another questionable medical tradition, plan sneeze. So this is the fault of one dude specifically. Unlike Estrostratus, he didn't get his name banned forever, however. So Greek physician Soneris was one of the best women's physicians you could find. No concept of how a woman's body worked and full confidence that he did. Perfect combo. He pitched that if women didn't want to get pregnant after, you know, doing it, they should squat, sneeze, and rinse. And just like that, you're pregnancy immune. Well, word spread of this method that allowed people to avoid weird olden contraceptives and not get preggers, so tons of people did it and tons of people got pregnant. Unfortunately, word of it not working did not spread as fast as the rumor that it did, and this tactic carried on in many regions of Greece for decades. Don't worry, Sonaris had a couple backup ideas. He also suggested rubbing honey or cedar resin on your hoo-ha before getting down, which was probably entirely too efficient between the mess and the burning sensation making people just call it quits on the act altogether for a while. Number three is before he cheats. Hold off on the baseball bat and the keys, Carrie. The Greeks got this one covered. Infidelity was a huge no-no and was even classified as a crime in ancient Greek customs. This went on for both men and women. If you were to be called before the courts and found guilty of this act, there were a few punishments, none of which maimed or ended your life. No, 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 no. They were quite unique. One of the most common was to insert peeled ginger root into the genital orifices of a man or a woman. This would cause intolerable burning sensation and pain to the intimate parts of the unfaithful. Another one was to have the pubic hair on your derriere burnt off with smoldering ash, which sounds just… I mean another option was a radish that had small holes in it pushed in your back door, which would be very itchy and very burny. Yeah, suffice to say cheating on your partner back then wouldn't result in getting your stuff tossed out on the front lawn or your PS5 drowned, more so in a seriously ingrained lesson on commitment via vegetables. Number two is the phallic festival. Huzzah! The time has come for us all to gather in the Acropolis and gaze down on the wondrous sight of oh, hoo hoo. I mean, if you're a visitor, sure, your reaction may be one of shock, but to the people of Athens, this tradition was highly cultivated and something people looked forward to year round. Once a year, their roads would come alive with all kinds of depictions and representations of male genitalia. This happened during the annual Dionysus celebration, a god of pleasure and wine, where men and women would march down the streets holding giant phalli proudly above their heads as a tribute to their gods, all while drunk out of their minds and on their way in a phallic procession to the temple of Dionysus. According to Aristotle, phallic processions were the birthplace of comedic theater. He claimed that people adapted the jokes they'd yell during the parade processions into full stage plays. So if Aristotle's right, all comedy began with the Greeks carrying giant cartoony dongs. And it's number one, the axe did it. Ah, projection, everyone's favorite guilt relief. This fable begins when the Athenians sacrificed foods and vegetables to the gods, not animals. Ironically, this is how they start. An altar for Zeus had been set up holding grains and cakes as a sacrifice. And when a wandering ox came across the altar, it trampled much of it and ate the sacrificial food. Well, like I previously mentioned, their gods were very real to them, and a man named Thalon, in anger, then killed the ox with an axe. Thalon was the first Athenian in the city to to have killed an ox and he fled, leaving the axe behind at the crime scene. The witnesses to the scene were shocked by the event and moved to prosecute Thelon for the murder of the ox. Despite his absence, they held a trial to charge Thelon, but it still didn't resolve the sense of communal responsibility for the 
of an ox going on without justice. An oracle spoke up, telling the Athenians they should eat the ox in a feast and repeat the sacrifice every year to compensate. So the next year, a group of ox were to be led to the original altar. Whatever one ate from the altar, that was the one to be killed. He was struck with an axe and then killed by a member of the Athelonian family, who would then throw the axe down and run away just like their ancestor. The other participants in the ritual then butchered and skinned the animal with a sacrificial knife and feasted on the meat. This could not be the end of the ritual, however, because a crime had been committed. The ox had been slain, just like before, so it's back to square one with another trial. Since the ox slayer had to flee, the girls who brought the water for sharpening the weapon were charged. Their defense was that those who actually sharpened the axe and knife were more responsible. The sharpeners in turn charged the man who gave them the axe and knife, and then that guy, he charged the butcher. But the butcher claimed the knife was more guilty because it did the cutting, and since the knife could say nothing in its defense, it was found guilty. And then the knife was banished by being thrown into the sea. To conclude this bizarre ritual, back on Acropolis, the skin of the ox was stuffed, stood up, and harnessed to a plow, restoring it to its pre-sacrificial condition. You've heard it before because it literally affects everything, but being a woman is up first. Likely as a result of the whole Pandora's box fiasco, wherein the first human, Pandora, is gifted a jar by Zeus on her wedding night, and he doesn't tell her, hey, don't open that. There's a bunch of demons in there that will, hmm, plague mankind. Pandora pops open her wedding gift, and just like that, Greek sexism is born. Distrust of women was embedded in the ancient Greek collective psyche pretty much from the start. Gender classicist Jeron Auckland describes the Greek opinion of a woman eloquently. Irresistibly beautiful, but parasitic and lazy artifact that sits in the house of a man and eats everything. This sexism floated across the realities of civic life, where women were unable to vote, own land, or inherit property. Females were often abandoned at birth, and girls' education focused more on preparation for child rearing than intellectual stimulation. Medical was laughable, and if a woman had an ailment, she was always to blame for it. Aristotle believed and insisted that women were deformed males, created after something went wrong in the mother's womb. Hilarious, because we now know that's actually quite the reverse, and that the male sex develops after the females. Plato warned men not to turn into women when they reincarnated, best done by finding success in their incumbent lives. And even Pericles said that the best thing about a woman was that she was never spoken about. The life expectancy for an ancient Greece woman was 36, and the average for a man was 45. Currently, the life expectancy for Greek women is 82 and for men, 77. So being a hater sucks the life out of you boys. And while we ride this wave, let's talk about how adultery is worse. Worse than what? Well, literally everything to the Greek. Even worse than being taken against your will, as the Greeks didn't consider that an act of violence against a person rather than property, which is what women were to their husband or father. For that crime, you'd be fined with literal property damage. Adultery? Whoa, as a woman, you'd best bet was to gouge your eyes out so you you never see someone hot and feel temptation ever again once that proverbial ring is on your finger. The Greek definition of adultery includes not only engaging with someone outside of your marriage, but also just being an unmarried woman who does the dirty and gets caught. Adultery was seen as a devastating impact on a family unit, which was a vital institute of Greek society. It undermined a household and therefore society. And if you can just undermine your whole empire for some nookie, it makes sense to the Greeks that adulterers could be killed on the spot if they're caught, not too far of a stretch. If the caught pair contained a married woman, she was immediately and legally divorced from her husband even if the victim husband wished to stay with her. He could also sell her into slavery if he felt like it. So, While you decide what to do with her, remember you can't smoke him, but you can go get like 20 years of pent out anger out on the guy your wife swept with because now it's your legal right to punish him with radishes. And you can only imagine where the radishes are supposed to go. And on the topic of law in ancient Greece, justice equals personal outrage. We all piss each other off. It has Happens. People can be abrasive, or they may have rivaling opinions, or sometimes you just talk too fast, and that's what it takes. Regardless of what you do wrong, people will deal with it and move on. If a law gets involved and is broken, there's an appropriate punishment and recourse via court, which is cordial and doesn't involve two people screaming at each other in front of a judge. But that is exactly what court justice looked like in Athens. According to punishment laws, rage was the heart of why someone was punished by society, meaning anyone could bring anything as a charge against someone else. On a hilarious note, that means about 96% of the surviving court documents from Athens features cases which revolved around how much one person just hated another and was trying to convince the court to hate that person too. Laws 
define just how much anger was appropriate response for certain actions. And once parties were in court, it was the prosecutor's job to make the jury feel just as angry about something so that punishment could be handed out. And that led to sort of an eye for an eye system, quite literally. So if you were unlikable in ancient Greece, best thing to do was stick to yourself. But I mean, we shouldn't be too hard on them for letting emotion bias their laws, right? Except for the fact that it happened more than once. Next up, people aren't perfect. Democracy was developed by the many ancient indigenous colonies that are found around the world, and its influence grew through history and societies. The Greeks adopted the practice of democracy, and they executed it in a way that makes them famous in history. However, even a system as revered as democracy can find itself utilized for more nefarious purposes. Best example, the Militinian debate of 427 BC during the Peloponnesian War, when a city-state of Mytilene had attempted to separate from the Athenian Empire. The revolt failed epically, however, and the Mytilians were forced to awkwardly submit to Athens again, like a Quebec Canada scenario. So it's up to the Athenians to decide what punitive measures to take to really teach these guys and make an example of them. According to Thucydides, it was in the fury of the moment that they decided to execute not only the prisoners they'd taken to Athens, but also the entire adult male population of Militine, and then the women and the children would be taken into servitude. They send a boat off with these orders, but as they're watching it float away over the horizon, they maybe have it click in that their decision to pretty much burn an entire city to the ground might have been made in haste. So since they've got so much time on their hands, they issued another debate on the subject just to be sure. A new vote was taken and it was decided that only the prime movers in the rebellion, a thousand people, would be killed instead of a hundred thousand people. A second, shift, a second ship is sent off to catch the first and reach them at Militine itself just seconds before the sentence is carried out. So democracy, pros and cons. Another reason to hate living here aside from bias politics is that medical kills. Because it wasn't until the 5th century BC that Greek physicians started looking at illness as something based in science. Before, the state of the human body was at the whim of the gods. So what that meant for a patient pre-science medicine is you'd visit shrines and temples and participate in rituals called temple sleep and incubation, wherein you slept at the temple, told the priest your dreams in the morning, and he'd either deem you cured or recommend you just do this again. And yeah, if you die, you die, I guess. I don't know. Then, when science medicine came along, you needed zero certification to advertise being a physician. Quite simply, medicine in ancient Greece was based around the idea that the human body was composed of a range of fluids. A good doctor was supposed to know each of these separate fluids, what they looked like, and what they tasted like, and that's it. Feel sick? Yak in a cup. Let your doctor take a swig, and he'll tell you what he thinks is up. Hippocrates said healthy urine should taste like fig juice. One less juice I am now going to try and lice. Unsurprisingly, treatments were just as disgusting as these ancient methods of diagnostics. In most cases, a doctor would prescribe a session of bloodletting to drain the body of bad blood, and anything wrong with a woman could be solved with meal dung mixed into wine. Yum. But their methods certainly might have been disgusting. Written histories from the time often make mention of people living beyond the age of 100. So maybe they were on to something. Number five, fleeing. This is straight up a crime, man. I don't care what you say. This is just a crime against humanity. I'm not here debating on how governments get rid of their let's say more interesting members of society, but this is not it. Popular in the ancient world for whatever reason, and I can't stress this enough, I would faint from watching. I was shivering writing this, seriously, it's the worst. This is the act where someone is skinned alive. They're held down and peeled back like a potato. There's multiple famous incidents like in art and mythology. I just, I just don't know who sits there and one day and goes, ah, you know what, this guy, yeah, we gotta skin this guy. Let's just skin him. Let's just let's cut him up. Let's go. Number four, the eagle dropping turtle. Okay, here we are. Top of the food chain. We're in charge. I'd like to make the argument it's not the things we eat that puts us there, but it's the things we don't eat. Think of all the animals at your favorite local Chinese buffet. Well, we as humans have adapted so much that we can survive and choose not to be carnivores or eat certain animals. Where am I going with this? Well, despite us being number one, sometimes the animal kingdom fights back. That's kind of how it works. Take Aeschylus in 455 BC, for example, a philosopher who found himself being struck by an eagle dropping a turtle onto his head. Unfortunately, the injury was fatal. Since we're talking about Greeks and philosophy, let's bring in a little law here. This is good, you'll like this. Mens rea, 
actus rea. While the eagle certainly didn't know he was committing a crime, he still did do it. Sounds like someone needs to go to animal court. Hmm. That's something they would probably do back then. I mean, they did medieval times. They put animals on court, so why not back then? Number three, Draco. No, not Malfoy. Not Draco Malfoy. I know you're all thinking it. That's what I thought too. Draco, the lawgiver of ancient Greece, was a man with modern solutions for their modern problems. He was asked to give a code of law to replace the very aged tribal feuding laws that still existed at the time. Commoners were shocked to find out that even trivial crimes could wind you up in the brazen bull. Or, uh, not breathing anymore. Uh oh. However, the wealthy, of course, loved these laws and applauded Draco. Classic villain story. They really loved it, so much so that it was Draco's undoing. As the legend goes, Draco was buried in a small mountain of clothes, hats, and garments. He suffocated under the pile of compliments. The accidental fatality of the man who gave us strict laws that are fatal. So, what do you, what do you charge? You, 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 you get in trouble for undoing the guy that's supposed to undo? That's, that's weird. I don't know. Number two. Prometheus. Oh mighty Prometheus, what wise knowledge of fire do you bring us today? The story of Prometheus is that of a very dark and tragic one. He was the god who gave humans fire, despite Zeus's wishes not to. Well, given Zeus's temper, he wasn't too pleased when he saw people grilling up their Slovaki. Love me some Slovaki, man. Naturally, Prometheus had to pay, so Zeus did something so awful to him, well, we still talk about it today. He had Prometheus chained to a rock where every day, at the same time, a large bird would come down and eat his innards. Just come and mm, just nom nom on his, on his insides. Gross. Since he was a god, he had Wolverine like healing abilities. But he wasn't immune to pain. It would still hurt. He'd heal every day, but. It would hurt really, really bad. Number one, Sisyphus. I think this one is relatable to everyone, including myself. Unless, of course, a large bird does rip your guts out from time to time, or you've been skinned alive, then, then that one's more relatable. I doubt that, though. Sisyphus was the king of Corinth and had cheated his meeting with the Grim Reaper one too many times. This made Zeus mad. So he sent in Sisyphus to push a boulder up a mountain forever. Every time he gets to the top, it just falls back down. And if that's not a metaphor for life, I don't know what is. No. Number 10, the classic. Alexander the Great is probably the most infamous person on this list. Shout out again to my late 90s PC gamers, but because of Age of Empires and Civilization games, you are probably familiar with old Alexander, one of the great conquerors of ancient times. So what does that mean exactly? Well, the man wasn't asking for land with please and thank you. He was asking with a spear and a shield sort of style. And by asking, I mean just taking. However, for the brutal, handsome young king of many lands, his time to bask in his empire was short-lived, as he died soon after Persia was conquered. His achievements cannot be understated, however. Conquering so much at such a young age was very impressive. Comparative to the mythological Achilles in grandeur. Number 9. A Man in His Barrel this is going to be very difficult to talk about, simply because I find the premise of this to be comedy gold. Okay, close your eyes. Imagine ancient Greece. A city like Athens is populated with the wealthy in gowns and robes, and maybe even a stereotypical toga. Buildings of white stone and marble. A market bustling with people haggling for fresh produce and cloth. Perhaps even a fountain with some flowers. Beautiful, isn't it? However, just around the corner, not too far from the town square, there's a barrel. A barrel that's shaking vigorously. And what is causing this barrel to shake? Well, that would be the man who lives in it, Diogenes. Yes, a philosopher who is self-gratifying himself in a barrel in public. Diogenes defended his behavior by saying how he wished it was as easy to relieve hunger by rubbing an empty stomach. Yeah, I was sitting in my study earlier when a courier handed me a letter. I opened the letter in a warm candlelight glow. It was from the chief. And he said that's not it. Number 8, Trendsetter. As if doing what Diogenes did in public wasn't bad enough, and I mean, come on, that's, that's pretty scandalous, he also would commonly defecate in public theaters and urinate on those he found annoying. Sure, maybe major cities need people like this. I mean, come on, would New York City really be New York City if crazy people don't yell at you on the streets all the time? Huh? Diogenes just may have been the first to do such crazy things. Also, I'd like to argue his philosophy. If you just give me a moment, if he pees on people who are annoying him, could the people that are being peed on not deem that annoying and then do the same in return? I'm not a smart guy like the Greek leaders, but at least I know how to use a washroom. Just saying. Number 7. High Fashion 
I say if you got it, flaunt it, humbly of course. Maybe a nice pair of shoes, your favorite pants, or for me, a brand new suit that makes me feel gorgeous, baby, yeah. But for the most part, I shop at Walmart. Let's be honest, I don't have that kind of money for the Gucci flip-flops down to the socks. However, for the great Greek philosophers like Socrates, they were wealthy enough to enjoy a literal finer cut of cloth. Yes, they could, but Socrates said no. I want the peasant look, please. Apparently, the wise Greek man often didn't wear shoes and always wore the same ratty coat. It's also said that Socrates wasn't exactly a good looker. Put on some shoes, though. That'd be rough. You're walking around all day with no shoes on? Oh, those would be rough looking feet, buddy. Number six, smart streaker. Anyone that's ever spent time with a physics professor has probably heard the story a hundred times, and that professor probably genuinely thinks this is a funny story. Archimedes, the famed Greek philosopher, made a strange discovery. Strangely. One night after a long day of hard thinking, he went to take a bath. Pondering the questions of life, he noticed something was happening in the tub. No, not his rubber ducky going missing, but rather a simple yet interesting concept of displacement. When he was submerged in the water, the water rose. He deducted that if he measures the difference, that would equal his weight of volume. And if it works with an old man, then it would work with other things as well. He was so excited by this that he shot up and ran outside screaming, Eureka, Eureka. Well, that part may not have happened, but if it did, I'd hate to be his neighbor. No one wants to see that, man. Number five, Spartan women. Okay, so Athenian women were kind of locked up in the house, didn't really have much freedom, but Spartan women were actually against the grain as to what was expected of women around that time. They ate as much as men, which was unusual. They weren't forced into marriage as soon as they were able to, so instead of being a mother at 14, it'd be more like 19 or 20 as previously mentioned. They were educated to similar standards of men. They were active and physically strong, which meant criticism from outside societies because because they would show off their bodies like, oh my god, her thigh, or she'd be naked, whoa, oh my goodness, like all this stuff. The Spartans believe that the stronger and more intelligent the woman, the better the male offspring would be. <laughs> Spartan moms were terrifying too. They were really witty and they could like serve you up real quick. Spartan women were also prized for their wit and intellect. They could own and manage property and were proficient in reading, writing, music, and poetry. They were also expected to participate in athletic competitions such as javelin throwing and wrestling, singing, and dancing. The Spartans loved to dance because it showed off the goods. This was also a kind of advertisement to Spartan men to evaluate the mother of their hopefully next son. Child rearing was to women what war was to men. The only way to get your name on a grave was if you died in battle and died in childbirth. Number four, diamastigosis. So we know, perfection as a human being was a really big deal to the Spartans. Diamastigosis was one of Sparta's most brutal practices. It was the most extreme test of endurance and a kind of replacement for ritualistic sacrifice. Adolescents were flogged in front of an altar at the sanctuary of Artemis or Thea. It was an annual practice used as both a way to satisfy the gods and as a method of testing a boy's resistance to pain. Until their blood flowed toward the altar, the ceremony didn't stop. The teens who were up to participate in the ritual did everything they could to harden themselves against pain, though some still died as a result. Uh, fun fact though, when the Romans invaded, uh, they actually made this like a huge show and kind of made it like an entertainment instead of just a ritual. It was bad. Number three, Cryptia. Uh, obviously, where there were slaves, a lot of people not cool with it, not gonna be happy, obviously, because it was the worst. You weren't considered human. So of course, uprising and rebellion is a natural byproduct of treating people like crap. So any teenage boys who demonstrated intense leadership skills would be selected for the secret police called the Cryptia. Their primary goal was to terrify the Helots into submission and weed out any growing rebellions and troublemakers. If they did find any, then they wouldn't even get a fair trial before they were executed. Pretty damn brutal and follows quite closely the patterns of slavery across the world. However, some scholars say that the Cryptia was also yet another test for the Spartan youth. After intense training, which we will talk about in a minute, they would join the Cryptia, the kind of next step in educational training. Participating in the human practice of punishing helots was part of their learning to become a great Spartan. Number two, agoge training. I've hinted at this the entire time. Being a Spartan boy was hardcore. 
You think you're hardcore for going to the gym every day guzzling protein shakes and lifting weights. By today's standards, you go man, that's awesome. But compared to Spartan youths, you'd look like a stay puffed marshmallow covered in kittens watching Disney movies. Like that's what you'd look like, you'd be like, you soft man. Aquagay was a state sponsored compulsory education system which emphasized obedience, endurance, courage and self control. By the age of 7, boys were sent to live together and their training began. They used harsh and cruel methods in order to harden the hearts of their future warriors. It literally turned childhood into the breeding ground for what would be considered trauma by today's standards. At age 12, they were stripped of all clothing save a red cloak and forced to sleep outside. They had to make their own shelter, encouraged to forage and steal food for survival, but if they were caught stealing, they were punished severely. Among fierce combat training, they were also taught to read, write, music and everything else. But by age 30, their training was complete and they were expected to marry as previously mentioned. But seriously, I didn't go into really full details because probably YouTube would get mad, but um, you can imagine, like, whew, beatings, it was nuts. Not a good time. But they were awesome at fighting. Number one, Mount Taigetos. Upon the birth of a Spartan, they went through a kind of Baptist initiation called Pieties. The infant was dumped into a vat of wine, and if they cried, they were considered weak. This last one is honestly truly the most like messed up and super, super metal at the same time. It's really bad. The Spartan youths were first evaluated by a council of elders. In the event they didn't meet their expectations, the babe was placed at the bottom of Mount Peigithos for several days. If they survived, they were celebrated and taken back to the village. If they died from exposure, the corpse was left behind. The third option was that the babe disappeared via sympathetic passerby, which did happen. The parents had to endure this testing of fate, for only a true Spartan could survive the impossible. This list was super fun to make. Crazy, but fun. My last fact about Sparta is that all the info I just presented to you didn't come from Sparta. Everything we know about Sparta came from records from exterior states who interacted with Sparta. They didn't write anything down about themselves, so who knows what else we do or do not know. Number 10, it's happy name day to you. Birthdays are basic and boring. Here in ancient Greece, we practice name days, a celebration of your birth title. In ancient Greece, names were deemed incredibly important and were given in a way meant to ideally define what a person would be like and grow to be. A great example is Aristotle, a compound name with Aristos meaning best and Telos meaning end. Pretty fitting and ironic for someone who would become the best philosopher of the time and also have a pretty not great end. Anyways, this importance of names meant that every name had its own special day in the calendar. So instead of celebrating your exit of the womb, you'd wait for whatever day was your given one and coincided with your name and that's what you'd celebrate. Name days aren't just in Greek culture and can be found in ones such as Eastern Europe and the Balkan regions and some still celebrate name day to this day. Some of us still get phone calls from angry aunts wondering why why they weren't wished happy name day on Facebook. Since it rhymes with wine, number nine is water it down. We know that many ancient civilizations didn't drink water due to how polluted it was. Whether that pollution was salt or feces, well it varied. Anyways, while many drank beer, the Greeks drank wine. However, drinking alcohol at every time of the day doesn't mean that there's a free pass to be drunk. Quite the opposite actually, as heavy drinking and drunkenness was looked down upon and seen as an embarrassment. This is because the Greeks associated it with barbarism. and many of their gods and their pantheons behaviors and stories also attributed to this. Wine without water was only used as medicine for sick or during travel as a tonic. As a result, the Greeks may have been pounding back the wine, but it was water diluted ratio, so the standard was 1 to 4. They even had a special container for mixing, boiling and then cooling this diluted mixture. Oh, and by the way, it was seawater they were using because apparently to quote, seawater gives the wine a curious salinity which mixes with the sweetness of the grape and produces a delicate taste, while at the same time preserving the wine for longer. Number 8 is he who must not be named. This is one of the pettiest and most specific ones you'll probably ever hear, and it's all because one dude screwed up so phenomenally it started an actual tradition. So what happened here was there was this Greek shepherd named Aristratus, and this guy had an idea one day to, you know, set fire to and destroy the temple of Artemis in Esphus. So keep in mind he did this in an era where the Greeks revered their gods the way that modern day religions like Christianity. Judaism, Islam, etc. do. These gods are real to them, so why would they destroy her temple? Which, by the way, is one of the 
seven wonders of the ancient world in our modern time. When pissed off Greeks came and found him to ask that same question, Aristotus essentially said his only intention in doing this was to achieve fame and his name to go on into history, the way that Alexander or Achilles had. He didn't care if it was in a good or a bad way, he just wanted that. Well, the entirety of Greece collectively said F that, once his intentions were revealed mentioning his name or naming children Aristotus was forbidden at the risk of being sentenced to death penalty. And so it became tradition that no one in Greece was to have that name. Number 7 is Don't Open Dead Outside In traditional Grecian lore, it was said that there was these walking dead as creatures. Legend forewarns that these creatures would rise from the graves at night to knock on the door of innocent civilians, saying their names repetitively as a lure to open up, as these creatures, kinda in a, like a vampire fashion, have to be invited in. If you didn't answer your door on the first knock, you were safe and no harm could come to you. However, if people were unfortunate enough to answer, they would die after a few days and then would be transformed into one of these creatures themselves. This is why the Greeks had a tradition, arguably even a superstition, that you should never answer the door on the first knock. Many still follow this tradition to date. Number 6. You don't want to be the bigger man We've all seen the Grecian statues, whether in photo format or lucky enough to see them in galleries or in the country it's themselves. But what we can all agree on is there's one added appendage that's hard to avoid noticing. Or is it? You may have noticed on male statues from ancient Greece that while they include his private regions, they are noticeably quite, well, small on every single statue. Well, this is a tradition that actually has an explanation that's nothing to do with shrinkage. In ancient Greece, a small package was actually coveted and seen as the pinnacle of male form. This is because it was consistently depicted in their lore that being well endowed was something for the mundane or barbarians. So traditionally in ancient lore, only foolish males ruled by lust had large, well, you get the idea. Finally, an explanation for the question we've all thought, uh, nobody said out loud. Number 5. Athlete Juice Speaking of gross, this one is straight out of Johnny Knoxville's playbook. Shout out to those guys. I hope one day I'm cool enough and famous enough to meet them. Maybe do a bit. Chetty's not and fun, so I'm down. Anyway, back to the Greeks. Remember when I said the Greek bodybuilders like to oil up? Well, so did the athletes. Here's where it gets gross. After days of events and running around in the dirt, naked with olive oil, these athletes wouldn't always bathe. But why? Well, the answer is marketing. Just like Gatorade commercials of the early 2000s, these athletes were covered in juice. This sludge was scraped off in what I'm sure was a very humanizing experience and jarred up to be sold like a superhero serum for the average Joe Schmo to drink or rub on themselves. This mixture was called Gloyos. No thank you. I will pass. Number 4. Nocturne and Toten It was 2008. I was alone in the dark one summer night. There, illuminating my poor innocent face was Call of Duty World at War, the latest action-packed Hollywood blockbuster FPS from Activision. Now, I always finish campaigns first before moving on to multiplayer. Just when I thought it was over, a new cutscene started playing, except this one was different. It was dark, and the camera was shaky. And that's when I saw them, twisted and screeching, undead, sprinting at me. I have never turned off a console so fast in all my life. Well, it seems the ancient Greeks shared this fear as well. To prevent zombies eating their very smart brains, the Greeks oftentimes buried folks with heavy stuff on top of them, just to prevent them from climbing out of their graves. That's uh, the smartest people on earth, and I think the zombies are going to come get them. That's crazy. That's uh, Guys, come on. Number three, diluted wine. The Greeks were well known for their artisan goods and foods. Their wine is no different. Some good stuff out there. However, did you know that Greeks would dilute their wine with a little H2O? Drinking wine pure was sometimes considered to be an unholy act, as it was said it could make a man unruly. Well, they're not too far off from the truth on that one, actually. Drinking too much wine can make you go a little silly. So yeah, diluting it kind of makes sense. Sometimes during hot weather, if it was available, snow was added for a cool and refreshing drink on the hot Greek island days. Sounds real kind of nice, that kind of like a, an ice spritzer, an I, a Greek ice wine spritzer. How nice! Wow. Number two, the finger, the ultimate hand gesture. I know you're gonna have to blur it out or not even put it in, but here we go. That's that's what I'm talking about. The ultimate hand gesture. It starts with a "Hey, I'm walking here," and ends with a simple finger in the air. It's been used for centuries and will probably be used for many more. Ever wondered where the origins of the most powerful hand gesture besides Darth Vader's force choke come from? Well, the almighty gesture has its origins in ancient Greece. Who would have thought? While no one is 100% sure the exact origins of it, we know it was used.
used back then, and it was around. The very interesting Diogenes was known to use it against those passing by he was distasteful of. He didn't like a lot of people. Maybe it was because it was simple, phallic, or just kind of strange. But at the end of the day, we all know what it means. And you! Number one, mud bath. I know Steve-O has literally done something like this before, and, and, and if there's rules you should write down, write this one very down, this second, right now, write it down. Be kind to another, sorry, be kind to one another, and work hard in life, and never do anything ever that Steve-O has ever done. Those are really good rules. Trust me, it's good words to live by. So what exactly am I talking about? Well, in ancient Greece, for those who could afford it and had the time, that, well, they needed to relax. I need to relax. They needed the spa treatment. Heck, I've never even been to a spa. Someone take me. The ancient Greeks loved mud baths, and from what I hear, it's actually got quite a lot of benefits to it. However, the Greeks added one secret ingredient. One piece of the Krabby Patty formula I know most of us would say no to, even plankton. Crocodile dung. Oh god, yes, that's right. They bathe in hot crocodile refuse. It's great for the skin, apparently. So much so, that it was thought it had beautifying and restorative properties. Go ahead then, jump right in guys, water's fine, come on in. Number 10, Tyrants. This is where the name comes from, folks. So we kind of wouldn't have the label if it weren't for ancient Greeks. There's been a lot of tyrants in history, but this is where it all starts. A tyrant refers to an absolute leader who uses his or her power harshly and crudely, exercising total control and oppressing those who stand against the strict rulings or are a desired target of which. Ooh, very fancy definition, Chetty. I like it, wow. The trick is seeing how history remembers you. Leaders like Pol Pot and Joseph Stalin are easily agreeable tyrants, but for example, the ancient Greek leader Alexander the Great can also be considered one. History remembers him for his great triumphs, and while that's interesting to look at, because, well, he's one of history's greatest generals, he's really amazing, actually. For the safety of our history class, that's fine, but his actual deeds, well, they were less than remarkable. War, looting, trading, YouTube's least favorite S word, and well, many, many more brutal things that the conqueror from another land did. Not good. Plus, if you were from another land and you saw him do what he was doing, you probably wouldn't think he was such a great guy. It wouldn't be Alexander the Great, it'd be Alexander the Big Stinky Tyrant. So, there you go. Number nine, Diogenes. This one's my favorite. Maybe the least famous of all philosophers, but one with a decent philosophy, or at least so I think so. That's how, that's how I feel, and I think it fits in with the modern, uh, the modern world. A man who was banished and exiled and had all his possessions stripped away. In some depictions, even his clothes. I, I wouldn't want that taken away. I gotta have, my, gotta have my clothes. Thus, the man was forced to live his life on the streets of Athens inside a barrel, as you do. This likely is what developed his philosophy of cynicism. He argued that since he was living free of tax or payment in his barrel, that he was truly free. Thus, he had less worries than the commoners, and yeah, that's where his freedom came from. Well, where does the crime part come in? Besides, well, the obvious tax fraud there, and we're gonna pay your taxes. Diogenes might have been a few gyros short of a picnic, if you know what I'm saying, as he would often shout at passers-by, and uh, well, he would, um, he would do the devil's bedroom dance solo in public, just in his barrel there, just doing, yeah, you don't, I can't say it, but you know what I'm talking about. Number eight, Sith Revenge. Well, I know a lot of people would be behind this, especially for really awful crimes. Revenge is not the Jedi way. Sometimes it was an option for the families of those who were wronged in ancient Greece to enact their revenge on the crook. Assuming, of course, the crook was caught. You can just imagine the kind of crimes, the, the really bad ones. You two won't let me say. However, the important point here is that the families of the victim were given a chance to make their peace, or well, whatever the antithesis of that is, usually involving the crook not breathing anymore. Kind of a kind of a, a blood for blood kind of thing. Sounds great at first, but I couldn't recommend it. I don't think it would, I don't think it would go well in people's conscience. I don't know, not a good idea. Number seven, exile. A classic of the old world. Just like Hellenic society itself, a common punishment for a severe enough crime was banishment. Sure, today there's lots of folks who like being alone. I, I swear most of the people I went to high school with were introverts. I was friends with all of them. I don't know why though, because I'm so extroverted. For example, Heraclitus of Ephesus. He was getting banished from ancient Greece and. It's a lot different than not being invited to Chad's birthday party. However, getting banished back then could likely see you with nothing, like previously mentioned before. Maybe not as bad or down bad as previously mentioned, like Diogenes, but still, still pretty rough. There were lots wrong with ancient cities, sure, but you were much safer in civilization than left outside of it back then. As someone who's seen a lot of bear grills, I wouldn't recommend going out of the wild back then. A trip, fall, a cut, that's it. 
Whew. Number six, the Brazen Bull. This one is a punishment and a crime. Two in one, baby. The Brazen Bull to many may just look like a statue, and worst case, Ontario, maybe the horns are sharp and could hurt you. Maybe. But don't be fooled, friends. This is much more than a statue of bronze or brass colored bull. It's actually a perp cooker. It's a twisted, awful, rotten form of punishment that could also be a crime itself. One against humanity, and those are the worst ones. Basically, you open the hatch on the bull and throw your bad guy in. Then, Get a nice big fire going, really big one. The same ones your dad does in the summer. You know the ones, the ones you can't even get too close to because it's too hot, woo. Then, wait, once steam or whatever horrible smelling vapors come through the bull's nose, that's when you know the perp is done and it's time to throw in another one. That's, that's awful, what an awful way to go. Oh. Number five, Statue of Zeus. Another one of the ancient wonders of the world. The statue of Zeus was a giant seated figure depicting the almighty Greek boy at 41 feet tall. Made by the Greek sculptor Phildios around 435 BC, built inside the temple of Zeus. The statue was made of gold and ivory, totally non-opulent resources. Ornamented with ebony, ivory, and more gold. Can never have enough. However, it was lost during the 5th century and really the only details we know about it are from the ancient Greek descriptions and representations on coins. When I pass, hopefully I'll have left enough comedy for the world to enjoy. Maybe I'll get an opulent statue too. Just no ivory though, that's that's cruel. So maybe we'll go for like an all maple wood statue or something since I'm Canadian. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Maybe a like nickel for Sudbury or something, I don't know, something like that. Number four, Constitution of Athens. The Declaration of Independence. Can you get a more important artifact from the past that shows how things worked? The Playbook on Democracy and Freedom. God bless America. That bad boy is locked up tight. It's important. Just make sure Nicolas Cage isn't anywhere near it. Well, the Constitution of Athens was equally as important, but uh, well, it wasn't Nicolas Cage, but we did lose it. Parts of it were recovered from a papyrus in the late 1800s, but more confusing than that is there seems to be two of them, for some reason. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a copy either. One possibly a student of Socrates, or perhaps one of Zenos. Truth is, uh, we're, we're not sure, and that's why it's on this list. At least we know John Hancock signed the Declaration of Independence, put a big old signature right there, and that, now we know, and it's locked up. Nicolas Cage can't get it. Number three, Pythagoras. A squared plus B squared equals C, or, or something like that. Or as Google calls it, the square of the longest side of a right triangle is equal to the sum of the squares of the remaining two shorter sides. Pretty sure I heard my math teacher talk about that once, but it's not that important, right? <laughs> I'm not doing much math, and my high school math teachers. I digress. I shouldn't be mean because she was actually one of the best teachers I ever had. The subject sucked, but she was great. Shout out to Miss Savage, you're the best. It seems the life and work of Pythagoras are somewhat of a mystery to the point where, well, it's like third hand information, and that's that's never good. A lot of him is told through that of Romans, which is then told through Germanic tales of him. So Really, we're just not 100% sure, but his math survived, so maybe there is some truth to it. Who knows? He, he made it to my math class, so. Number two, Homer. Known as an overweight American family dad who resides in an unknown state at 742 Evergreen Terrace. Just kidding, we're talking about the smart Homer who arguably wrote two of the best literatures ever, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Some historians believe that Homer may not have actually existed though, and just like his yellow counterpart. There are some that think perhaps Homer was just a writer's name and it was actually a teamwork of actual writers who composed the work. It doesn't change the work, but uh, well, we'll probably just never know. Number one, Lost Island. Greeks seem to have a knack for losing islands in the ocean. Atlantis, and now this. Today, in what is just off the coast of the Dilkali Peninsula, was the island of Arganusa and the city of Cain. Philosopher Xenophon talks of the city and its battles. However, if you look there now, you would not find very much, as the island has sunk and the city is gone. It's kind of hard to live underwater, we're not fish. Now in its place is the peninsula. A team of archaeologists in 2015 declared this was the site of Cain after discovering evidence of an ancient harbor. Ottoman maps depict the island being sunk as early as the 1600s. Look at that, you learn something every day here. Look at that. Number 10, lifelong soldiers. From the time they were born to the day they died, men were forbidden in Spartan society to be anything but a soldier. They had to live and breathe battle. How, how the heck did they do anything else? How'd they get their food, do their taxes, live beyond that? Well, most of the time it was the women who did it and as well as their slaves, which we will talk about more 
later. So if men wanted to weave baskets or be an artist, I want to be an actor dad, be an accountant or literally do anything else. No go. It was forbidden by law to be anything else besides a bloodthirsty, spear wielding, rippling abbed hero of the Spartans. Unless you were an old dude, it stopped around when you were 60. Then you could run the politics and make all the decisions in a three stage process. Now, some men would probably dig that, but everyone's built differently and you would be ridiculed if you weren't, I don't know, awesome at your job. Number nine, diet and exercise. Living among the Spartans was essentially like living on a diet and exercise retreat in California with all the hippie moms who were like, it's okay, I can just eat an almond and then feel great. And you could never leave. In order to prepare soldiers for the scarcity of war, they doled out rations that were always just like slightly not enough, just slightly insufficient and very bland. I mean, psychologically, if you are building machines for war, probably a smart idea not to make them used to indulgence and make them resourceful. But they were raised with a specific kind of hatred for anyone who did not maintain their physique and diet. If you didn't maintain yourself at peak physical fitness, then you ran the risk of public ridicule and even being banished from the city state. But they did drink wine, however they were very strict against inebriation and would even get their servants drunk to show the dangers of it. Number eight, hazing and fighting. Today, we know bullying is bad. I hate it, you hate it. Kids are so mean, like so mean. And it seems to be an everlasting battle trying to teach people not to be to each other. I don't know, it's just really hard, man. Why can't we just all be nice and get along? But in the Spartan world, hazing and fighting was encouraged. It all goes back to being ready for war mentality. Grown soldiers would often stir up strife and conflict between children in order to toughen them up. Those who showed signs of cowardice, timidity, weakness in general, they would be punished severely. After all, there is no room for retreat in front of the enemy. So literally, while you're getting bullied by your peers, your teacher comes over and joins in. Number seven, marriage. Marriage. Marriage is what brings us together today, especially if you are 30. On top of training as a warrior your whole life, Spartan men were forced to be married by the age of 30. If they got married before then, they'd still have to live separately from their wives in an all male commune. So if they wanted to see their bride, they had to like have their mates cover for them and sneak out at night. But it was considered a failure as a Spartan man to not produce heirs, especially sons, back into the population. Now women usually got married at the same time as men, about 18, 19, which was typically older than other civilizations. But they weren't forced into it. Both men and women had to be equal to each other and approve of their physical health and fitness of their partners. Spartans saw marriage as a means of making more Spartans, so if it ended up you couldn't do it, you had to find a partner who could. In some cases, both men and women would have multiple partners with multiple children who would belong to all. This is where it gets weird. The night before the marriage, the women had to dress up as men, have their heads shaved, and they were left in a dark room until their man, like their suitor, came into the room and kidnapped them. Number six, Mycenaean helots. So, I previously mentioned that men were banned from having another job besides being a warrior. Though they were educated, they couldn't do anything else besides train. How did anyone get anything done? Well, the women were educated and free most of the time and completed a lot of the work, but the main source of work came from the Mycenaean helots, aka their slaves. The Spartans invaded and conquered their next door neighbors, subjugated them, and made them slaves. They were like, we're gonna go train all day. Uh, ladies, we're gonna do other things. Uh, you guys are gonna cook, clean, do everything else um, while we live our lives. Right. This was totally unique to the Spartans as opposed to anyone else in Greece. Their neighbors were called Helots and they lived in Messina. They became the engine of Sparta for free, sadly, and they weren't treated very nicely. Though sometimes they were partied with, I don't understand. It wasn't a good time. As you can guess, slavery equals bad. Number five, wine time. When we think of ancient Greeks, we think of wine and parties and apparently naked exercise, right? But was it really a drunken festival of love all the time? I mean, hangovers are a thing, right? We need some recovery days. When did Gatorade get invented? I don't know, this is it's probably hard to keep up. Ancient Greeks actually rarely drank wine without diluting the hell out of it first. To water the wine, the ratio was four to one or five to two. Either way, it's, it's just water at that point. 
So you'll be hydrated, that's for sure, which is great, but you're not really getting drunk, so I don't know what the point was. Regular Joes would drink at taverns and the rich would throw house parties, so some things, of course, have stayed the same after all these years, but ancient Greeks believed that drinking undiluted wine could cause blindness or insanity. My friend, I think that's just called blacking out. I don't know, who knows? If you did happen to drink too much wine, the fourth century poet Amphis, he's got your back. The best way to cure those ancient hangovers was to boil some cabbage. Nice, just what you wanna smell after a night out. And in order to keep the party going without embarrassing yourself off some sparkling Shiraz, the best way to party and stay sober was to bake and eat a pig's lung. That's the trick to never getting drunk in ancient Greek times. Again though, I think that was just eating food. I think eating food helps before you drink. Either way, if you're gonna drink, do so responsibly. Eat some pig lung and then you'll be good. Number four, bronze bowl. On a list of unusual things ancient Greeks did, I think it's fair to throw in the bronze or the brazen bowl. There was a bronze sculpture, often in the shape of a bowl. Yeah, obviously. Usually it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, it's, I think I saw this in a Saw movie one time. That's how, you know it's, that's how you know it's good. Once the person was locked inside, a fire would then be set underneath this bronze bowl, and then you could probably figure out the rest of that situation and what happens to the victim inside. We'll say victim inside, not person. Victim. Horrible, horribly, painfully. It's, it's all bad. They engineered the bowl so that when somebody screamed inside, it sounded like a bull's roar. That's haunting. That's actually really horrible. Every time I talk about this, I'm like, mm, this is real life. Real people did this. It was designed originally for Phalaris. He was a horrible ruler. He ruled around 560 BC, but the sculpture for Phalaris was built by Perilus, the guy who made the brazen bull. He was sadly the first victim. That's why you don't make torture devices, but I don't know. Number three, Greek statues. Okay, I'll lighten up the mood a little bit. The last one was a bit dark. We've all done this at one point. Maybe you're at a museum and you see a statue. It's right there in front of you. It's carved. It's pure beauty. It's massive. The warrior represented has like 15 abs. It's made of bronze, eight feet tall. The amount of detail gone into their body is jaw dropping. Truly, it's impressive. But did you know that ancient Greeks would make their their, their bird uh, small on purpose? Uh? On purpose. Yeah, men who were well endowed were more often than not fools. They were foolish. Only They only ruled for lust, right? They were just craved fools with big birds. If you had a big brain, however, oh, you were the talk of the town. Ladies would whisper about you when you pass by in the street. Did you hear about Brian's big brain? Oh my God. He's got his dad's brain. Whenever an actor would play a fool on stage, they would be given a comedically large uh, setup. You know, that's how you know he's the villain or the fool, the bad guy in the scenario. The way we see these statues today meant that they had self-control and intelligence. I always thought they were just in a cold room when they were getting their stuff carved, but that's what this channel's for. History, but make it a little silly. Number two, the Battle of Marathon. Every New Year's, there's always that one guy on Facebook or Instagram who just becomes a runner just overnight. Just, they have the little squirt water belt thing that they, they shoot it, you know, the whole thing, the whole setup, and they train ideally for a marathon. That's the big thing that they talk about for an entire year, this marathon. What is a marathon? Was it a person or is it just a name for 42 kilometers? Well, it was actually a battle back in 490 BC. That's how it kicked off. Between ancient Greeks and Persian invaders sent by King Darius, the Persians arrived to Marathon, there was about 20,000 of them, and they arrived to punish the Greeks for supporting the Lonians, who revolted against the Persians. Now the Greeks were outnumbered here at this point, but they attacked hard and they attacked fast. They took out 6,000 Persians and eventually they just fled the scene entirely. The number of Greek fighters lost was around 200, so far less casualties. The story of Phidippides came to be at this time. He ran the first ever marathon. He ran all the way from Marathon to Athens to deliver messages because Blackberry wasn't a thing, obviously. So some guys had to be like, you bet. <laughs> Imagine servers back then, they're like, would you want a large soda? You got. He was one of the Greek military men known as day long runners. He did six marathons back to back. My knees hurt just saying that, you know what I mean? So next time you see somebody on Facebook become a marathon runner, just post a link to this video and be like, you got it. You're almost, just do six in a row and you're good. Also do six in a row naked in the heat and you're good. And finally, number one, human sacrifice. Of course, we got to end on something crazy like this. We found the remains of a 3000 year old skeleton in Greece. They found the skeleton on the side of Mount Lycaon, which historians know as the site of animal sacrifice for Zeus. I don't know why I pointed up, but probably not down or yeah, Zeus, he's up there. Yeah, 
Ancient writers mentioned this site and how human sacrifice was also at play here. And now, thanks to technology, we can confirm that this was for sure the case. We talked about zombies earlier and how bodies would be buried with like rocks in them and stuff. This is a bit different. This is actually much different. The upper part of the skull that was found was missing, first of all, and the body was laid on two lines of stones with stone slaps just laid on their pelvis. Now, Greece, of course, is the birthplace of philosophy and democracy and all that good stuff, but they also did some sacrificial shady stuff in their off time as well when they weren't slamming water down Merlot. Science allowed us to look all over the world too, not just Greece. There's ancient Egyptians, Aztecs, sometimes after Mayan ball games, the losing team would be sacrificed. Yeah, that's pretty brutal. Everyone talks about how awful humans are now. Well, we've always been the worst. The Greeks just like to party while they were doing it. Number 10, hotel speed. Okay, picture this. You're young and in a hotel with your parents. Maybe it's a vacation, maybe it's a trip, or maybe it's a hockey game, nice. Nonetheless, you find yourself in a long hallway with a strange looking carpet. Hotel hallways always have weird carpets, I don't know. Maybe it's the giant hamburger and milkshake you just ate. Maybe it's the hotel TV or the excitement of just not being at home. But something has changed. You're different. Your powers have been amplified. For this corridor will be your personal racetrack. A shame Guinness World Records isn't here to clock you in at max speed because for some reason if you fly down that hallway any faster, the rug would catch fire. Yes, the joys of running down a hotel hallway. This is probably how the first Olympians felt at the first Olympic Games. I'm comparing it to that for some reason, sure we'll go with it. Where the only event at these Olympic Games was running. Like many of the other events that would later come later on, this was done without clothing, which is fine. As long as you're, you know, not doing that in the hotel hallway. Keep clothes on. Number nine, WWE, brother. Only if you could have seen the look on my face when I discovered that wrestling in the WWE isn't as real as I thought it was. The shock, the confusion, and the loud ringing in my ear. It really, it was pretty serious for me. I got really into it as a kid. It gave me some Vietnam flashbacks, seriously. You mean to tell me that there was an intricate planning into every hit and fall, every entrance, and every time we heard the sound of a steel chair connecting with someone's forehead? Oh man. As a kid, I never would have guessed that, but when The Undertaker walks in a room, you take notice. Those thoughts just go away. Sadly, the ancient Greeks did not have cage matches, turnbuckles, or personas based on hyper male confidence. What they did have, however, was some real wrestling, some bare knuckle, no clothes, oiled up kind of wrestling. Nice. Instead of a one leg up pin, a scoring system was used for when the opponent's body was on the ground. And I'm sure lots of people got injured in the process. Whew, no thanks. I'll stick to the cage matches. Number eight, pank ration. Here's another story for you. It might seem kind of silly, but growing up, I got to witness the birth of a mainstream sport. The UFC got its start in the early 90s, but blew up in the mid 2000s. Now, I'm not much of a sports guy. Besides major championship matches or games, I don't really watch any sports. I'm more of a film and video game guy, if you couldn't tell. However, my first interaction with the UFC was seeing an octagon shaped ring, and my grade two geometry immediately kicked in and said, that, that's an octagon, wow, okay, that's different. However, the second thing that I noticed is that this was not wrestling, and this wasn't boxing. It was kind of a mixture of both. Sort of a mixed martial art, if you will. Well, that's kind of what Pank Ration was. There was no indirect punching or kicking, but pretty much anything else goes. To me, this sounds like a good way to get injured. Kind of like wrestling before, now it's just even worse. And as I'm sure you all know, paper cuts can be lethal back then, so maybe not such a good idea. Did I mention this is done without clothes too? There's, everyone's, everyone's naked. Number seven, the road trip. This isn't an Olympic event, but honestly, it should have been. Think about it for a minute. I want you guys to look out the nearest window right now. Get up, go ahead, look out the nearest window. Tell me what you see. You probably see a road with cars. When you need a fast food fix, it's as simple as getting in a car and driving on the road to your destination. Or getting it delivered with your favorite food delivery app. It's 2022, we can do a lot of crazy stuff now. What I'm getting at is that people from all over the Greek city states came to Olympia to witness the first Olympics. Except, you know, it would have been a triathlon just to get there. Frankly, my biggest fear, walking. That was the main mode of transportation, which after a while in those sandals was probably hell. Imagine trekking many, many miles by land and sea to only be exhausted to watch athletes become exhausted. Oh, I need some water just thinking about it. Woo. Number six, peace. Peace. What's better than a good war? 
a better armistice, or at least I'd like to hope so. During these first Olympic Games, which on a side note, if I had a time machine and a scooter, I'd love to see firsthand. There was people and athletes coming from all corners of Hellenistic civilization, all Greek states and colonies. Well, sometimes these Greek states got caught up in these little things called wars. Who knew, right? But when the Olympics were on, a truce was called. Messengers were dispatched to announce the truce, which gave all the people traveling on their long treks safe passage. I also find it somewhat amusing that they did this all for one day. That's right, the events only lasted one day. Some folks did days of traveling only to have it all be over in 24 hours. The opening ceremony couldn't have taken that long either, so. I feel like it's kind of a waste of time. Only if we got some of that peace right now. Russia is looking at Ukraine a certain kind of way, just, just waiting to act up. Bad Russia, stay in your corner. At number five, democracy? Though the Greeks are often credited with the creation of democracy, much like anything else in this world, it has a dark history. One of injustice and bloodshed. Back in the days of ancient Greece and in the relatively early days of democracy, this political practice could sometimes be used for nefarious purposes. One of the best examples of that comes from the Mytilian debate of 427 BC. Basically what happened here is that during the Peloponnesian War, the city-state of Mytilene tried to free itself from the influence of Athens. Athens. Their revolt ultimately failed, and the citizens of the city-state were subjected to a severe punishment. They decided to not only execute the prisoners that they'd taken to Athens, but also the entire adult male population, and women and children were sold into slavery. The vote to put a stop to Mytilene weighed heavily on the minds of those who voted for this outcome, so they later staged another vote, ultimately choosing to only punish those who were directly involved in the city's revolt. At number 4, Crime and Punishment Earlier I mentioned one of the gruesome ways that people were punished in ancient Greece, but let me tell you some more about their ways of crime and punishment. The standard form of executing prisoners was by performing what was called a bloodless crucifixion. Basically, the convicted individual would, quote, be fastened to a board by the wrists and ankles, and a collar around the neck would be tightened gradually to strangle them to death. End quote. If an execution had to take place on a battlefield, the accused would be beheaded, but if given the option, you could sometimes avoid a violent death by instead choosing to ingest poison on your own terms. If you committed a crime and were able to avoid execution, then you would be exiled. If your crime was bad enough to be banished from your community, then your name and crime would be inscribed somewhere so that no one forgot what you did, meaning that your crime would be known for the rest of time. At number three, this is Sparta. As you could imagine, childhood during ancient times was certainly no easy cakewalk, but one of the worst upbringings in ancient Greece had to go to the young citizens of Sparta. Just to give you an idea of how life might have been as a Spartan, just think about the fact that it was literally written into law that Spartans had to be quote, fearless, ruthless, and disciplined above all else. End quote. Back then, a young Spartan boy would only grow up with his parents until he was seven years old, which at this point he would then be sent to a military camp run by the state where he would stay until he turned 30. Young Spartans were taught mostly about fighting, perfecting the art of combat, and would spend very little time learning math and music. These kids were taught to be ruthless, stealing for their survival, and not showing any fear towards their enemies. At number two, ostracism. In Athens, back during ancient Greece, ostracism was a common aspect of political life. Back then, the citizens would evaluate the performance of their politicians. They would then vote on who didn't serve them well or who they didn't like, and the citizens would write the name of said person on a piece of broken pottery. The person who gained the most votes from the public would then be exiled from Athens for 10 years. Unfortunately, this was kind of a flawed system, and any clever politician would then be able to use this ostracism vote in order to get rid of their rival. After Athenian figured out the flaw in their system, their ostracism votes were later ended. And finally, at number one, sacrifice. At this point, after learning about so many ancient civilizations, I think it's safe to assume that basically every civilization had their sacrifices. Human sacrifices, I mean. It's been theorized that perhaps the ancient Greeks were participating in such practices because back in 2016, the remains of a teenager were found on Mount Lycaon, which appeared to have been, quote, a product of ritual sacrifice, end quote. It is thought that perhaps this person was meant to serve as a sacrifice to the god Zeus. On top of that, there has also been pieces of ancient literature that depicts the sacrificing individuals in the same area that those remains were found. We don't know for certain if this kind of ritual was part of everyday life or if it was just a one-off type deal. Number 10, Greek Pyramid. 
Okay, so ancient Greeks. You got your beautiful women, olive oil, olives, togas, beautiful white buildings. I mean, come on, what am I missing here? Shout out to the Greek community, by the way. Chetty loves you, especially the Danforth. It's a Toronto thing. Well, what if I told you ancient Greeks built a pyramid? Two to be exact. What? I know, right? They are nothing close to the size or the ones that are in Egypt, but that's okay. Nothing's gonna be like those because those ones are the best. More interesting than that is that we don't really know that much about them. Uh, they are notably in poor condition and scientists are still speculating on who, what, when, why and how. All we know is the where. It's in Greece. That's all we got so far. Kind of interesting though. You, you, think, you think pyramids are Egyptian, but no, they're in Greece too. I guess they're everywhere. Who knows? Anyway, number nine, Greek computer. The Antithic... The Antikythera? Antikythera? Antikythera. The Antikythera mechanism. Ooh, I said that right, I hope. This sounds like something straight out of Call of Duty Zombies, but all right. I'll bite, I said to myself when looking at this strange contraption. In a nutshell, it's described as the oldest example of an analog computer, which is a fancy way of saying a basic or manual powered computer that calculates simple solutions and or outcomes. It might not sound like much, but to me, it's, well, it's pretty cool. I was born in a unique time. I saw home computers become mainstays in everyone's home, and then in the late 2000s, become not even a second thought in everyone's home. By then, everyone just had a computer. It's kind of crazy how far we've come. Sure, this machine was simple, but it makes us wonder what else may have been lost to time, and it's speculated that it was used for calculating constellations, dates, and stuff like that. Simple, but very complicated. I know I can never build one. Pretty cool. Number eight, Greek cult, also known as the Eleusinian Mysteries. Super secret cult meeting with weird rules. Every generation has this. The Greeks had this. The founding fathers had the Freemasons. And we, we have anime. Anime North, right? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I, love, I love you guys. I'm just joking around. Trust me, there's some crazy clubs out there, man. This cult was so mysterious that well, the word mysterious kind of comes from that. It was all about Demeter and her daughter Persephone, and to join, you can't have unalive anybody. That was like the main rule. You can't, you gotta be, you can't have a, you can't have a rap sheet, bro. No rap sheet. Which, to be fair, is a good prerequisite. I wouldn't want anyone in my club to have that either. That's about where the info well dries up. We don't know that much about them. Kind of reminds me of the Assassin's Creed Templar stuff, though. Just saying, it's kind of weird, kind of similar. Number seven, the first actor. Lights. Camera, action. Marlon Brando, Robert De Niro, Leo DiCaprio. Some of the best actors of our time. Marlon Brando would probably say he's the worst in some sort of weird humble brag, but that's just the guy he was. However, who was the first? Thesipus, who jumped on the back of a wooden cart and began reciting poetry as if he was the character. <sighs> art. Today, that would probably get you locked up in a rubber room, but back then, it was art. Thus, inventing thespian theater. You gotta appreciate waking up one morning and just inventing a new art medium. Yes, I love to be in the back of carts. <laughs> Number six, the Colossus of Rhodes. Another one of the seven wonders of the ancient world is the Colossus of Rhodes, erected by Charles of Lindos in 280 BC. It was constructed to celebrate the successful defense of Rhodes City against an attack by Demetrius Poliokrates. That's the best you're gonna get, folks who had besieged it for a year with a large army and navy. According to modern descriptions, it was 33 meters high, or 108 feet in American. During an Arab conquest in 653, she was completely destroyed and all her scraps were melted down or sold. Since 2008, there has been talk of rebuilding this beauty and hell, I say why not? It would give me another reason to travel to Greece. I wanna do traveling, baby. I wanna get on my airplane for the first time. You know, get on there. Maybe make a vlog of it. That'd be kinda cool, right? And while on the subject of their miraculous medicine, how about a medical mystery we may never solve? Were they colorblind? Interesting, I know. I hope I got your attention with this one because even I looked twice when I found the journal article on this. So this theory comes from a few historical sources and some historian opinions. According to Mark Bradley, associate professor of ancient history at the University of Nottingham, color operated in a very different way in history from what we use today. According to him, the Greek 
Six viewed color essentially is the visible outmost shell of an object. So fire wouldn't be red, it was fire colored. Dirt wouldn't be brown, it'd be dirt colored. The sky would be sky colored. Skin would be skin colored. They wouldn't talk in the terms of abstract color labels like blue, mauve, chartreuse that we use today. This explains why conversations of ethnicity don't show up much in ancient Greece. That's some context for you. Anyways, a great example is how Homer, in his famous works like the Iliad and the Odyssey, describe the Mediterranean Sea as a wine dark sea. Have you ever looked at the ocean and thought, ah yes, grape juice? Homer actually only names a few color terms and uses the same colors to describe objects that look quite different, such as comparing the color of a seagull to that of a bush. Two very different things. So if this theory is true, it would really suck to see the world in a little bit less color than we do now. Another mystery but one to fear would be the unknown plagues. Anyone who happened to be living in Athens in 430 BC had about a 25% chance of dying in a horrible, horrible way, and historians aren't really sure exactly what happened. So the basics are, it was during the Peloponnesian War, and Athens was under siege when an illness broke out. It's assumed the illness was brought by invading soldiers in their blood or in their mucus. It's very 2020 pandemic style. It lasted for around five years, and the death toll was catastrophic on top of the war. Most of what historians know about the plague comes from the writings of Athenian general Thudikis, and what he described isn't anything clearly recognizable as one particular plague or illness, rather a combination of symptoms of multiple deadly illnesses like smallpox or typhus. Victims suffered from fevers, bloody and swollen throats and tongues, and finally violent excrement that drained the last of the life out of them. In 2006, a study where DNA was collected from the teeth of ancient Athenians swiftly buried in mass graves suggests it was typhoid fever, but not everyone's convinced. Another recent suggestion was an outbreak of Ebola. Whatever it was though, it killed a lot of people in a really bad way, and this was just one of the plagues that hit Greece. This was the only mysterious one, however. Here's an annoying one that would make things suck two times a day. Imagine asking for the time and someone replying, which one? Well, aside from those who randomly have their cell phones set to 24 hour clock, this scenario usually doesn't happen, but it did in ancient Greece. The ancient Greeks had two different concepts of time, using two different words, chronos and keros. The former refers to time as we know it and measure it today, the chronological time. The latter signifies proper or opportune time for action. In other words, the right time to do something. In contrast to chronos, which is quantitative, keros has a qualitative nature. Where there's a time, there's a place. Ancient Persegerians thought Keros to be one of the most fundamental laws in the universe. In Aristotle's scheme of rhetoric, Keros plays a very important role, as for him, Keros is the time and space context in which proof will be delivered. One watch on each wrist, ladies and gentlemen, because one will tell you it's 4pm and the other will tell you it's time to dump your girlfriend. And by checking your time for action watch, you may know if it's time to get pluck in. As you can probably guess from looking at the statues and other works of art they left behind, the ancient Greeks weren't a fan of bodily hair. To be smooth was to be the epitome of beauty, but whoever went for a wax in ancient Greece would have been in for a rough ride. There wasn't waxing solutions or razors. You sat there and plucked out every hair on your body one at a time. You could always burn your body hair off, that was a popular option, but I mean you have your risks with that. Now strangely, less is more didn't apply to eyebrows, where people were trying to grow a literal bush. Monobrows were a highly desirable look to be prized or envied, so makeup and fake hair were applied. Meanwhile for men, the smooth things still goes with exception to beards, which were a prestige symbol for men. Their grooming was of the utmost important and also subject to competition between men, as all things somehow managed to be, which made the good hairdressers very sought after. Hear that? The bro bond between a guy and his barber? Ancient concept. So yes, while hair was considered by them to be the most valuable part of a human body that could be produced, and it gave the dead the power of their journey to the underworld, on the other hand, losing hair for ancient Greeks was not a negative thing. Thing. It was even their indication of wisdom, this being the reason most statues depicting philosophers are bold. And last but not least is Creighton's creation. I'm about to talk about something without talking about it. So what did the Creightons create? A form of widely accepted and acknowledged kidnap, which then later evolved to become a consensual release by the father of a young man from his father's household to an of age man who would be his guide to adulthood. In the Hellenistic world it was accepted, hell expected. It was always up to the older man to do the pursuing and this is where the rooster comes in. Upon seeing the young man he'd like to guide, he would present him with a live rooster. In Greek society, this would have been seen as a gift hard to turn down, so few young men did. And so began the relationship. Think of the other name for a rooster, so this is kind of a really metaphorical gift. Anyways, traditionally, they would go out into the wilderness together so the young man may learn hunting, fishing, navigation, foraging, plant identification, and pore over 
poetry and literature. Later, the young man and his guide would return back to their home city with the young man as a comrade to the man now, living with him in the city to learn manly responsibilities there instead of the back 40s. But of course, such relationships couldn't last. It was customary for the man to release his young companion as soon as the latter started to grow facial hair, which genetically is different for everyone, so some men got away easier than others. The young man could then either continue his relation with the guide or publicly denounce him for any misbehaviors that occurred during their time together, which might as well be the barest minimum punishment for an SA to have ever existed in human history. Which is why it easily tops the lists of reasons why living in ancient Greece would have been impossible. Kicking off the list at number 10, the bird. The bird is not the word. It's actually pretty offensive. To flip somebody the bird or to flip somebody off, of course, means to give them the middle finger. What are these little troublesome guys right here? What are these blurry dudes right here? Do we even know why we do this? I mean, I don't recommend it because obviously you'll get in a heap of trouble from whoever's on the other end, the receiving end of said finger. But giving somebody the middle finger comes from the fourth century BC in Athens. The philosopher Dino Genes expressed how he felt visitors about Demosthenes. He described him by making a, well, you guessed it, a middle finger. It's a phallic gesture. The middle finger is supposed to be your, you know, the, the your bird, for lack of a better term. And the surrounding curled fingers are meant to be the you know, the other things that are around said thing on the body. I'm trying not to say what I really want to say here, but the bird is meant to, you know, it's supposed to be one of those. The more you know, ancient Greek history, who would have thunk? Number nine, Colomores. While the Greeks were going head to head with the Turks, they were fighting over their independence, of course, and the Greeks had the upper hand at Acropolis one day. They were surrounding their enemy and they had this stronghold in their grasp, and the Turks at the same time were running out of ammo and options. They then began to break apart the marble columns around them, just smashing them to pieces, just breaking them as fast as they can to try and get lead from inside and use that as ammo. Now, as the Greeks witnessed the destruction of their Parthenon, they panicked, obviously. They said, here, just take ammo instead. Whatever you do, just don't break those columns. We can keep fighting. In fact, we'll supply you the ammunition. Just don't break those columns. And they did. 1821 Greek War of Independence. Here you go, Ottoman Empire. Take this lead. Now we can fight. Let's do it. It's like when you're at a house party, they're like, just fight each other. Just don't put a hole in the wall. I'll be grounded. Seriously. I can't fix that. I don't know how to. Number eight, zombies. It doesn't matter what the context is. Zombies are always scary. Whenever we talk about ancient Egyptians, we break down the process of mummification. And you know what? I'll be honest, I missed that part. Just keep everything in jars. Keep everything separate in different rooms. Keep everything safe, surrounded by treasure in the middle of a tomb. No zombie is coming back to life if that's the case. You know what I mean? Well, ancient Greeks actually believed in zombies as well. They had steps they would take to prevent the dead from ever walking again. Archaeologists found graves where bodies were weighed down with rocks, or they would be pinned to their tombs. One of the two. Both pretty horrible. They weren't called zombies, of course, but rather revenants. Reanimated corpses that return to terrorize the living. AKA zombies. It's, it's, it's a zombie. Dr. Solowski Weaver explains that bodies found at a cemetery near the ancient town of Camarina in southeast Sicily were feared to come back to life at one point. The town was once a Greek colony, of course now modern day Italy, but it's home to a third century cemetery with around 3,000 bodies in there. There's more than half of them that are buried with coins, the usual, but a few of them were found in specific ways, peculiar ways. One body found in tomb 653, their body was covered in large fragments of amphora. So it's whatever it was underneath there, they didn't want that to move. Which is weird, because you're like, okay, I know that they're dead. Why are we putting a rock on them, you know? That, that fear, we still have it today. Number seven, stone cold. When the pandemic first began, one of the hardest things to get a hold of, surprisingly, was toilet paper. Yeah, it's pretty important. It's more important than we realized because that was the thing on the news that we saw. People just boxing each other at a Walmart for toilet paper. When you run out of toilet paper, you often remember that moment regardless of where you are forever. Leaves of three, let them be. That's all I'm saying. But ancient Greeks used these small ceramic pieces to wipe. Yeah, ceramic pieces, like sharp. French anthropologist Philippe Charlier expands on this toilet hygiene history in the British Medical Journal. It was these flat terracotta discs found in these ancient sites and they had residue on them, so the proof's in the pudding. They also discovered a Greek cup which said, three stones are enough to wipe one's arse. Three stones. See, even today it's like three pieces, you know, three slices, three stones. It's always three. Yeah, Greeks would use pebbles to wipe their butts. Never take the go for granted ever again. Number six, naked exercise. Okay, this one, honestly, I'm just saying it's unusual, but I'm on board with it. You ever forget a towel when you're showering? You gotta do that weird naked silly run through the hallway. I'll be honest with you guys, that's my favorite run. I feel like one of those aliens from Signs, just walking around all light, naked, and lanky. Just meant for speed, you know, meant for greatness. Just wet, just 
like a lizard just slipping around all over the kitchen. Ancient Greeks used to work out naked. The word gymnasium translates to the Greek term gymnasion, which meant school for naked exercise. Yeah, growing up, I always wanted to go to Xavier's school for gifted youngsters. Now, I just want to go to Ezekiel's school for naked exercise. Just don't set up shop behind the guy working on his squats. That's probably a bad idea. You know what? The more I think of this, the more I convince myself it's a pretty terrible idea. Hey man, do you mind spotting me? Sure. Number five. Well, I had the high ground, Anakin. According to a disputable legend, however, given my semi-okay Palpatine impression, I had to include this on the list. Basically, Amdocles was a smart dude and had just earned himself a decent track record. He helped save people. Dude was credible. He gained somewhat of a following afterwards, almost to the point of worship. This may have gone to his head as he started to believe his own divineness and jumped into an active volcano, where strangely enough, he does not come out of it. Now I wonder what would have caused that to happen. Perhaps maybe he didn't have a certain galactic friend who was the Senate, the whole Senate, and nothing but the Senate, and could shoot lightning out of his fingertips and help out of someone of the burning lava, yes. Number four, manure burial. Heraclitus had edema which is basically some bloating in the hands and feet due to excess water and fluids in the body. Not a big deal. Although, sometimes in ancient times, all diseases were serious because, well, in ancient times, frankly, a papyrus cut could be the difference between you attending the next celebration of town or taking a cruise down the river Styx. Heraclitus had a solution for this. As a learned man, he was never wrong. So what was his scientific medical solution to his ailment that might have gone away on its own? Well, he basically buried himself in manure so it would get rid of the excess water in his body. Yeah, I, I don't know how that works either. Unfortunately, he was attacked and eaten by wild dogs in his mud bath. He did not make it out. Number three, boys club. Hypatia was a female philosopher at the Library of Alexandria, something that any archeologist or historian would give their right kidney to witness in its glory. What's so scandalous about her, besides being a woman with knowledge that would scare a lot of men at the time, <sighs> things were all right until a Christian mob discovered she was a pagan. Well, this certainly could not stand, and in probably the weirdest assassination attempt ever, she was unalived by being sliced with clamshells, or roof tiles, the translation gets a little lost. Regardless, we're not playing Clue here, so it doesn't matter if the Christian mob uses the shells in the library or not. The fact is, an intelligent woman who taught others was removed for no good reason. Number two, countrymen, lend me your ears. Zeno of Elea was a learned man, and in a rebellion against his leader, Nearchus. He was captured and received the beating only a stepson would know. However, in Zeno's final act of defense, he asked Nearchus to come close so that he could whisper in his ear. And channeling his inner Mike Tyson, reeled back his head and came in to take a bite out of his ear like Scruff McGruff the dog takes a bite out of crime. Sure, he was victorious, but history tends to remember things like that. You got a page in a textbook somewhere, so you know. Number one, Zeus. Does this man deserve an introduction? Here's another topic that could honestly be its own video. Zeus, the god of gods, the man with all the power and the affinity for tossing lightning bolts the same way Gordon Ramsay tosses salads. But I'll just write them off for you. Turned his first wife into a fly and ate her. Constantly unfaithful to his other wives. Tied Prometheus to a rock and had his liver eaten by a bird. Wiped out humanity. Cursed a man to push a boulder up a steep hill for eternity. And made Atlas put the world on his shoulders. Shout out to my people in the audience who get anxiety trying to order a pizza over the phone. Now imagine you have to literally hold the whole world on your shoulders. Oh, too much pressure. Yes, I know Zeus is mythological, but a lot of others on this could be as well. This was a long time ago. Some documents just didn't live that long. Number 10, stone toilet paper. It's been said that only two things in life are certain, not living and taxes. However, I think a third point needs to be added, and that's everybody goes number two. It's a part of life. You eat, your body takes in its nutrients, and then it gets rid of the waste. That's the cycle of life. It's kind of beautiful, actually. Then we all have to use an invention that I know we're all thankful for, toilet paper. But have you ever wondered what people of ancient times did? I know I do. After all, there was no Walmartius to purchase Greco Papyrus Rolius, or the Greek staple that is olive oil. Trust me, that'll come into play later. Well, the answer, my friend, is very simple, even simpler than the three seashells, and everybody knows how to use them. Cleansing stones, yes, that's right. Smooth, rounded stones, 
just for the occasion. My mom always joked around about using newspapers like some folks did in the old days, but stones, they actually use stones to do that part. A little too rough for my uh, my Gerber baby bottom, if you will. No thank you, no. M mom, I was a Gerber baby. Number nine, painted statues. When you close your eyes and think of ancient Greece, what do you imagine? Oh yes, I'm just imagining it right now. Beautiful coastline cities with harbors bustling full of ships carrying fresh fish and cargo. Men and women flocking the brick streets and markets. White marble monuments surround the city like clouds of opulence. And the statues of pure white marble depicting Greek gods and myths of yonder. Sounds great, right? Well, what if I told you that not all these beautiful white statues that you could see in museums were pure white marble as we know them today? Yes, that's right. Greek marble statues had color. They were painted with the best and brightest colors they had at the time. It's only with time that the color has faded. Some people want to repaint only after a few short years. Try a couple thousand. Number eight, beef up. Gotta get the gains, gotta get swole so your Discord crush will send you the heart emojis and oo-oo's that you so desire. I'm sorry, that's so cringe, I'm so sorry. At least that's how I'm told romance works these days. Romance might have changed, but working out has not. The ancient Greeks worked out to maintain a peak athletic performance. That's right, brother. However, it wasn't exactly treadmills and pumping iron. One Greek athlete's training involved carrying a cow calf around all day until the calf reached adulthood. Pretty cool. This is all done naked, by the way, though, and slathered in olive oil. Not so cool. Athletes also ate their fair share to keep up with all the working out they did. Some cases up to 10 pounds of meat and bread a day. Talk about beefy boys. That's right, brother. Number seven, one night sneeze. We've all been there. It was a hot summer night. You went out with a couple of friends for girls night. Tonight is all about the ladies. No guys, you say to each other. And now you're in the club and drinks are flowing. And that's when you see him. He's tall, handsome, and his blue eyes. You're smitten. Hours later, you find yourself under the sheets up to the neck like it's a primetime sitcom. The sun peers its way through curtains that haven't been cleaned since he bought them. And yes, yes, that's right. That's a one night stand. They happen, and sometimes people just want to have a little fun. Can you blame them? I can't. What I'm getting at is sometimes nights like those can have an 18 year investment after a nine month down payment if you catch my drift. The ancient Greeks had a simple solution for ladies who weren't interested in that kind of bargain. Sneeze. Yes, sneeze. Hit you. Sneeze. Sneeze away the night of Cinco de Mayo tequila shots at a bar called O'Grady's. The Greeks believed if you sneezed a whole bunch, you couldn't get preggers. Simple. It's just simple. I can do a sneeze, dude. Simple. Number six, tasteful doctor. As humans today, we have a lot of knowledge in the medical field and we're only getting smarter. Who knows what we'll be capable of in a hundred years? It's kind of amazing to think about. Well, despite the technology that the Greeks did not possess, any college professor today will tell you that they were not stupid. They weren't. We owe a lot to them. Part of that is in the medical field. For example, urine tests. A lot can be told about a person from their urine. The Greeks knew this, but they didn't have all that fancy schmancy machines to tell them what was in their urine. Instead, they did the next best thing and tasted the forbidden lemonade in order to determine what was wrong with the patient. Sure, you can tell a lot by that way too, but if the person was sick, well, well you know how that goes. Let's keep the lemonade in the cups, please. Mm, yes, I believe. Yes, you have something wrong with your liver. <laughs> Number five, tanks. Okay, so after a few Olympics, people got tired of walking those many, many miles just to see some dudes run a mile. We need more events, said the Olympic organizers, but what? We have athletes running, what else is there? Okay, okay, I hear you. What if we get athletes to run, but with full military armor and gear on? Yeah, that's right. There was another race where athletes would wield the armor of the Greek soldiers and race. I can imagine that there was a clunking noise, or at least a lot of it, and also how difficult it must be to run in bronze armor. I'm gonna let you guys in on a little secret. Come a little closer. A little closer. A little closer. Whoa, too close. Bronze armor isn't good for chafing. Cause let me tell you something, hot Mediterranean sun, not a lot of water, and running in hot metal attire? Someone's gonna have to come over and put baby powder on my bum bum. Number four, the classic. I don't know why, but when I think of ancient Greeks, I think of grapes on the vine, marble, chariots, and, and the movie 300. It's, it's kind of hard to forget those spray on abs. 
Although someone could put them on me, it'd be kind of nice. Equestrian events were another event of the ancient Greek Olympics, and I have something nice to say about something for once. While every other event was dominated by males, because, well, only males were allowed to compete, of course, the equestrian events allowed women. Nice! And naturally, ladies, when someone points the spotlight on you, you shine. A notable winner of the event was Sinisica, a Spartan princess and athlete who was an excellent horse breeder. I guess that's a nice thing to be remembered by. According to some records, two monuments were built in honor of her victory. I rode a horse once. I can firmly say that I prefer the automobile. Just saying. You walk around like that, that's why all the cowboys walk like this. You just do that all that. Number three, the long jump. After running and running in armor, it was discovered that jumping makes for a great Olympic event. How high, how far? It's simple, really. It should come as no surprise that I did not perform well in that section of track and field day at school. To my disadvantage, there was no strength-based events because it was considered unhealthy for us because we were so young. Yeah, I wasn't sure about that. My counter to that argument would be, why are you making tubby kids run the 1500 meter? That's liable to have the kid with asthma writing his math test in the hospital bed later. I'd probably be joining him. However, I am a supporter of the Ancient Greek jumping event. Basically, athletes gotta jump as far as they can whilst holding two large rocks. Now, if we did that today, people would know what it's like to do a long jump when grandma feeds you too much. Yeah, it's not easy. Number two, the discus, the javelin, and the hammer. Sounds like a good band. Hey, these are all events that we still compete in today. That's awesome. But doesn't it make you nervous when the athletes are throwing those bad boys around? Especially the hammer throw. God, it just makes me so nervous. While I couldn't find an exact example of an accident happening, I doubt the ancient Greeks had safety in mind for spectators. The discus was made from stone or bronze, and they were tossing those suckers the same way Guy Fieri tosses Caesar salad. Which is a lot, because he's kind of a big guy too. However, for me, it's the javelin that's most terrifying, as that was an appropriate weapon of war for the time. And athletes are just throwing them around like it's nothing. You're telling me the crowd was a safe distance away from the splash zone? Yeah, just keep your eye on the sky to be safe, folks. I don't know about that. Number one, rap battle. Honestly, this is something we should bring back to the Olympics. While I was complaining about not being able to compete in strength-based events earlier, I, as a theater kid, would have much preferred some of the other less intensive events the ancient Greeks had up to offer. The ancient Greeks were not just chucking stones and chafing in bronze armor. There was also a competition with the arts, poetry, song, and singing. Imagine if America entered Eminem into a rap battle contest. There would be no contest. Imagine if Canada entered one for musicians. KD Lang, Celine Dion, oh, and Anne Murray, just singing angels. 